Without further ado, please welcome Guillaume and Pikachu on stage now. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, hi everybody. Hi, Pingu. So, um, we are going to present what we have been doing lately with cars, actually. So, who are we? Uh, my name is Stanislas Leger, um, Pikachu. I'm an IT student in uh, EPITA, a school in France, and I'm part of uh, EPITA System and Security Laboratory, the LSE. I'm currently an intern at Quark's lab. Uh, I like a lot of stuff like reverse engineering, everything that is related uh, to cars or mechanics, and if there is something stupid to do, I shall already be doing it. And with me will be Guillaume Hayes. Hello. <laughs> Uh, my name is Guillaume. I work as, uh, at Quark's lab as a security engineer. Uh, I'm quite, quite new to the security field as I worked uh, in the industry before and uh, I switched to the security field because it's very fun and I like to reverse uh, almost everything and I will give a small talk about reversing a piece of hardware that you can find in, uh, in an automobile. So, what is this talk about? Um, this, we, uh, this talk will be in two different parts. The first one is how to drift with any car, and it's uh, an introduction to automotive systems, what you can do with them, and what, what we actually did with them. And the second part, which name is how to properly write an Amazon review, you'll see why just after, is uh, nobody don't go, so uh, analysis, reverse engineering, stuff like this. So, first part, drifting with any car. Uh, the idea is that I'm a student, so I work at my school's lab, so I had to find a way to explain why I was bringing different cars every day at my school's garage. Uh, so the official goal was to look at how a car works, and what arises from this is, what can I do, what can one do with a modern car, car system? Uh, the restriction I had was that, since I'm a student, I'm poor, so I don't have a lot of money, and I don't have a lot of cars, so I was actually taking my family's different cars and trying to analyze them, so I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to uh, break anything or uh, remove any parts from the car. So, the test subjects. Uh, what, which cars was I playing with? I had uh, five or six of them. The first one, for posterity, is mine, actually. It's a 2006 Volkswagen Polo. Um, what is nice is that you can spend the whole day trying to find some messages on your bus. Uh, if uh, your car is too old, there are no messages, so you can take the oscilloscope and try to find them. You won't find them. Anyway, just before doing anything, try to uh, think, is the something I'm looking for really in there? The second car is my grandmother's car. It's a Volkswagen Polo of 2013. And the last car I will talk about is my mom's Fiat 500 uh, convertible. It's from 2010. Uh, the dates are important because uh, the CAN bus I will talk about just after is quite recent in a way that security on the CAN bus var uh, changes greatly from one year to another. So the canvas I was uh, playing with on this f uh, car was quite different from uh, the 2013 Volkswagen Polo, for example. Okay, so talking with the car. So this is the um, introduction part. Sorry if people already know about what I'm going to talk about, but I want everybody to be on the same first step. So, first of all, an ECU it stands for Electronic Control Unit, and it's a, it's a small computer that you get all around your car. So there are many of them. You can have at most 70 of them in very modern cars, and they control different parts of it. So you have the engine, the powertrain, the transmission, ABS, stuff like this. And uh, they talk to each other on what we call the CAN bus. The CAN bus is a message-based uh, broadcast protocol. Uh, messages are mostly composed of two important things, which are the ab arbitration ID, which I will refer to ID from now on. Uh, they can be 11 or 29 bits long, and you have data. Uh, data is 8 bytes long on a standard CAN message, but they are on top protocols that can group messages together to get uh, bigger lengths of data. 
What is interesting is that it's a, a broadcast protocol, so the um, collision detection system is based on the uh, ID. The lower your ID, the higher your priority. So very important CAN message will have a very low ID. They will be sent from an ECU that have a very low, low ID. And a um, less important one will have a bigger arbitration ID. How do you talk to your CAN bus without cutting any wire in the car? For this, there is, the, there is the OBD2 part. So OBD stands for uh, Onboard Diagnostic and is the vehicle self-diagnostic and reporting capability. When you are driving, you have uh, a, LED, a LED that starts to blink on your dashboard saying, OK, something's wrong. You bring your car to your car repair shop and the car repair guy will, ju will just plug itself to this port, which is located around the steering wheel uh, often and a query information using PIDs. So a PID is a parameter ID. It means, okay, I want to have information about, for example, the RPM or the speed or the fuel level, something like this. And it can set or reset diagnostic trouble codes. A diagnostic, diagnostic trouble codes means, okay, something is wrong with this part of the car, for example. Here is my setup. So uh, with just a Raspberry Pi, a uh, PyCAN 2 shield and a DV9 to OBD2 cable, I was able to have a full Linux that, ca that can understand CAN messages and talk with the CAN bus. So with that, I could just communicate with my car without breaking anything, which is quite nice. How, what does it look like? So in Python, it just import CAN, so uh, it's a standard package, Python CAN. You create an interface, so uh, it's socket CAN, so it's like any kind of interface. You just create a CAN zero interface and you can communicate with your CAN uh, bus. You create your message, so the data is here. What is important is that the first byte tells how many bytes are important in the message. You can have eight bytes of data. Uh, the number of bytes processed will be this number. So like there it says, okay, there are only two bytes of data that are interesting, just discard the five other ones. Here it's asked for the first mode, so OBD have different mode. Uh, oh, the first mode t uh, says, okay, I want the current value of what I'm looking for. And zero C is RPM, so I want the current value of the RPM. If I put two there, it's the second mode, and it asks for the RPM when the last data trouble codes was actually set. You have different like that, but what interested me was, okay, what is the current RPM? You create your message. Uh, 70F is the classic ID for diagnostic tools, so uh, most ECUs will answer to OBD queries if you, got, if you have this ID. On 29 bits, it depends on the car, uh, on the Fiat 500, for example, it was this one. You send your message, you get your answer, and that's it. Okay, so uh, this was the theory, how do you talk, but how did I actually talk with my cars? So the first OBD answer I was able to get was on my grandmother's Polo. It's quite a recent car, 2013, so there was a gateway, a sort of firewall between the OBD2 port and the actual CAN bus. So uh, when I plug myself to the CAN bus, I wouldn't receive anything unless I send an OBD query. I would receive my answer, but that's all, uh, else the bus would be completely silent. So here are, here are some examples. So this is the one from just before. How can I get the RPM? So this is the value of the RPM. Here I can get the engine coolant temperature. Very important. So the idea is that I, it answers 83, and 83 is 131 degrees. Uh, the idea is that you, can't, you are working with unsigned bytes. So if you want to get a negative temperature, the standard tells you to uh, uh, subtract 40 from your uh, temperature. If you are uh, outside of minus 40 or 215 uh, degrees, you have other problems than your coolant temperature. <laughs> so, seems to work. Okay, nice. So, displaying everything. This was to explain to my grandmother why I was stealing her car for two weeks right now. So, with this, I'm able to get the RPM, the speed, engine coolant temperature, always very important, throttle and accelerator uh, pedal, pedal position, and the elapsed time since engine started. So, anyway, kind of graphical, my grandmother understands, everybody's happy. Right. So, right now, I can query standard OBD PIDs. I can have the RPM, speed, fuel level, anything you would want to have on your uh, dashboard. But if you want to get some probably more interesting stuff, you have to go with the constructor-specific PIDs. 
for example, the steering wheel position, brake and clutch pedal, gearbox status, light or blinkers are constructor specific, so you have to break stuff to be able to find them or have very good friends with manufacturer, which I haven't. Um, nice, we can query stuff, mostly. Can we modify anything, interest, anything interesting from OBD? Because still, I don't want to mess with the car uh, by cutting any wire. So first issue, what protocol am I actually talking to? There are on-top protocols like KWP, which is Keyword Protocol 2000, Unified Diagnostic System, ISOTP, the Volkswagen version of ISOTP, like really, and stuff like this. Which protocol am, am I talking to? Okay, let's just brute force by sending the classic uh, introduction kind of message and try to find for a valid answer. With this, on the 2013 Polo, I could speak UDS. So UDS enables different kind of things like resetting ECUs, which can be quite interesting, query specific PIDs, uh, read DTC information, stuff like this. Uh, however, nicer stuff like dump the firmware are only available through security session. And security session on this car requires an authentication through a challenge response kind of algorithm. So here is the example. Uh, I would uh, start a diagnostic session, UDS, diagnostic session first, then a query for a seed to get uh, through the security session, uh, compute my answer, send it back, the car's compute its own answer, compare, and I would fail because I would just send the seed back like maybe they didn't implement a real algorithm, you never know. But, hey, okay, well done Volkswagen, they did it quite well. Actually, uh, the car has a four byte seed it, which is different at each try. This is important to notice because on Guillaume's car, it's a two byte seed which is always the same. You have more than, more than three seconds required between each try, and if you fail uh, multiple times, it will just freeze for 10 minutes if you don't want to remove the battery or that kind of complicated stuff. So, how to break this? Brute force, <laughs> wait long. Uh, timing attack will, would be too unstable because of the uh, priority kind of thing, because you can just get uh, delayed by other more important messages, and so it will delay your, your timing attack. Disassemble the car is out of the question, you know why? And get pieces from a repair shop is tedious. You know, get an ECU, try to recreate the CAN bus around and stuff like this. But, and I'm broke, so <laughs> I don't have any money. Okay, so my car, let's sum up. Way too old. My grandmother's car, bit too recent because of the gateway. My family's car is a Lancia Voyager 2014, so even more recent. But it has Uconnect, so maybe for another time. Who's left? Oh, mommy? So, my mom has a 2010 Fiat 500 convertible. She loves it. So she doesn't like when I take it, and she even more doesn't like when I try to do stuff with it. Uh, so one night, I stole the key. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and I tried to plug myself in. Uh, oh, it talks. It talks a lot. Uh, in four seconds, I was able to get uh, 2,000 uh, around message. So it's about 500 messages by second. There is no gateway. So I have a lot of broadcasted message already. Uh, they are from few different arbitration IDs. So few different ECUs are actually talking on this bus. Um, when I'm in the car, I try pressing random buttons. And I see that the data evolves. So the nice funny things to do is to try to understand what each message means. It's quite tricky with scan dump, with the, which is the standard Linux utility, utils which will just flood your STD out with scan messages. But Python can monitor helps a lot by uh, grouping messages by arbitration ID. So here I'm in the Fiat 500 and I am driving, actually. And you can see the different arbitration ID there and the uh, data that is evolving. The two last ones, which are way bigger, are the standard OBD, meaning that, okay, I have a priority that is way lower than the uh, other kind of messages. So, reversing a bit, what can we find? Uh, I found the speed uh, full time. Uh, the values were quite different, but quite close uh, anyway. So, was it at four different time or at the four different wheels? And it was actually at the four different wheels because when I had turned, it would uh, change drastically two values out of four. 
Uh, I have the clutch pedal with respect to the accelerator. Am I accelerating while depressing or pressing the uh, clutch? Uh, the brake pedal, are the doors closed? Which one are closed? Is the contact on? Is the handbrake up or down? And this one is quite interesting because it would change every minute. Actually, it's the time and date. So it was 9 p.m. on the 24th May of 2017, meaning that they created an ECU which only job was to send the current time and date readable in hexadecimal format on a can dump. Like this. <laughs> that, that, that was, I found it funny, I have a weird sense of humor. Anyway. So, displaying even more stuff, this time to explain to my mother what I'm doing with her car. So, uh, this was the kind of uh, capture I was doing from my school to my home, uh, like I was recording what I was doing in the car, recording at the same time the can dump and displaying what I could display. So I have the handbrake, start and stop, engine is on, okay, it seems to be. The doors are closed, hopefully. Okay, so this, this was quite fun to do, actually. Okay. What can we do with that? Can we do something useful for humanity? Can we do maybe something a little bit challenging, or else it's absolutely not interesting? Or can I at least put something on my resume after that, something I can be proud of? Yes. Or we could try to do something completely stupid, and that's what I was aiming to do. So I created CanPad. The idea of CanPad is that with the steering wheel, a brake, and an accelerator pedal, you can drive any car in any video game. So... <laughs> so that's what I did. I take the, uh, the can messages from Mobidi, send them back, pass it to a Python, a Python client and float them through U, U input to be able to create a virtual gamepad and play in VDrift. So VDrift is, the, is an open source uh, racing game that allows one to uh, play on Linux through at least LibU input. So this is the start and stop button that I use as a toggle to send data. And here I'm driving with my mom's car a car in a video game. So I have the steering wheel, the handbrake, uh, all every pedal is quite, it's quite hard to drive right now. And my official goal is to drift. So first I have to learn how to drive at all. Uh, it was actually quite nice when I managed to do anything at all. So you can see the data is only like 16 bytes long. And uh, that's the best drift I was able to do on this game. So I was actually quite disappointed right now. So. Features and limitations of this. So the features is what I was uh, explaining right now, but the limitations are that the engine needs to be running because else I don't have the assisted direction, which makes the wheel quite hard to turn. Um, also, on a real car, if you release the steering wheel, it will by itself try to match the car's direction, which I don't have, so I would just spend all my time turning the wheel. And the control simplicity going through uh, uh, LibU input uh, limits it to VDrift because uh, no other Linux game recognized my virtual gamepad as a real one. So I was quite sad, and, but I really wanted to drift. Oh wait, I created another way version, which is CanPad V2. CanPad V2, I just uh, understood that on a real game, uh, game box, Xbox, Xbox gamepad, if I plug the Xbox gamepad and don't touch anything, no uh, inputs will be sent. Uh, 
On, a, on another hand, if I put a PS4 uh, gamepad and don't touch anything, it will flood the status of every button all the time. So what I would do is take the Xbox controller, put it on the table, and hijack its port to send data instead of it. So I would have a real, a real plugged-in controller that is recognized by nicer games, like Vidri, uh, like Dirt, and I could send inputs by my, myself. Uh, I change a few stuff, like the gas pedal, because I had to flow in the real world to flow in the game which was quite uh, fuel-consuming. Um, <laughs> the steering wheel rotation uh, was uh, adjusted so that it, match, uh, it matches rally cars. Like, if I turn it 180 degrees, it will turn all the way in the game. So, quite nice. Huh? And I found the direct command to query handbrake. In the, in the video, in the next video, you'll see that when I turn abruptly in the game and I release at the same time the unbrake. They will take a little bit of time before uh, stopping to turn because I have a small delay, but now I have the real, um, real input, so it's way easier. So, demonstration. So, same, same stuff. Start and stop. I just wanted the music. So anyway, as you can see, it's way easier to play because of the uh, steering wheel which was adjusted. It's way nicer to drift in this. I can do the crying drift. My brothers were very fond of this. My mother was only thinking about her tires right now. Anyway, sorry. I'll, I'll give you the title of the song later if you want. So, I can now drift with my front wheel drive car in any kind of video game, which is almost quite very nice. So, uh, possible upgrades. <laughs> yes, there are always upgrades. Uh, I could get the gearbox statues to put the car on the lift and try to put it in manual, which would be a bit more life, uh, life, life kind. And create a better gamepad so that I'm able to race on Mac or Windows because right now it's only on Linux. Um, okay, this was fun, but it was actually consuming a lot of gas for nothing. So with Guillaume, we tried to find a way to uh, reduce gas consumption, and that's what he, he is going to talk to you about right now. Guillaume? Yeah, thank you, Stan. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Stan had a little problem about the gas consumption, and a friend of us told us, about this little uh, nitro OBD dongle, which is supposed to save fuel. It's sold on Amazon, and the reviews are quite good. So we said, OK, strange, but OK, let's try it. Um, first of all, uh, just a reminder about the, uh, what is an OBD2 dongle. An OBD2 dongle is a small device uh, that you plug into the OBD2 port of your car. Uh, any recent car has an OBD2 port. You can find it by googling uh, the model of your car and OBD2 port, and you will find a picture of it. And the interesting thing is that you just have uh, to pull a panel to access to your OBD2 uh, port. And it's very cool because you don't have to take anything apart or whatever. So uh, just buy the thing on Amazon, uh, pull the panel, and put it there. That's all. Um, so, uh, this dongle is supposed to uh, save fuel by reprogramming uh, the main ECU, the engine ECU of your car. And this is done uh, for quite some time. This is known as uh, chip tuning, and you can find it on the internet. Uh, it works pretty well. It will break your, war your warranty. But the very interesting thing about this dongle is that it will not break your uh, warranty because if you remove it, you will go back to factory settings, and this is very new. So it works on any car, well, any recent car, and, uh, well, it seems to work really well. Okay, um, so why, why, why did we reverse engineer uh, this dongle? Um, <laughs> because it's just an amazing piece of hardware. If you think about it, it works on any car, 
Um, and it also reprograms any car, so it must contain uh, all authentication codes. Uh, Stan explained the challenge and response mechanisms, so uh, this one must contain all of them. Um, it will also contain the, um, the reprogramming uh, software for any car of any manufacturer, and this is also just amazing, and I just wanted to have a look at this and it is able to adapt itself to the way you are driving for a few kilometers, then it will reprogram your engine. And I say, wow, there must be a very smart algorithm inside this very small piece of hardware. And I just wanted to have a look at this software. Um, as I said, also, uh, it also modifies the RAM of your engine. And um, uh, I was not aware of anything uh, that will be able to do that, because uh, from the things I know about chip tuning, it will change the flash of your ECU. That's why the warranty is broken. But not this one. Not this one. And this is just amazing. I just wanted to have a look at the source code. Well, the binary. Okay, so uh, the thir third thing about uh, reverse engineering such a piece of hardware is uh, monitoring the CAN signals. Uh, to see if it's talking and uh, what, he, what it is doing exactly, if it's uh, opening security sessions or not. Uh, well, all this stuff. So, um, here you see in my car, there is uh, the OBD2 port right there, and I use the same configuration as TAN to record the CAN messages, which is a Raspberry Pi here and the PyCAN 2 shield. And, well, just often a microscope to check the signals and the computer to, to monitor this. Um, the thing is, you just have one OBD2 port in a, in a, in a car and, uh, here. And you cannot plug at the same time the dongle, like, like this, and uh, the, the, the wires for the Raspberry Pi. So, um, we, we took apart the dongle, and after a bit of reversing uh, the PCBs, we found the can uh, lines and the ground, and we just soldered three wires on it. And, and with the, using this approach, you can reverse uh, the, the messages sent on the bus. Um, the interesting thing is that as you are plugged directly on the dongle, you will monitor exactly what, what, the, what the dongle is doing and what he's seeing. Um, ju just for reference, you just have three wires to put uh, in a car to hijack or to communicate on the CAN bus. Those are uh, CAN high, CAN low, and the ground. And that's basically all you need to, to connect to a CAN bus. Um, just for reference, you can find uh, on, on today's cars, you can find many, many CAN buses in, uh, in, in the different parts of the of car. Uh, so the OBD2 uh, port is just more accessible, but it's basically uh, another CAN bus just like another one. Okay, um, <laughs> so um, we did two uh, measurements. One with uh, basically no OBD uh, dongle plugged in, uh, and the other one with the OBD uh, dongle plugged in. Stan explained in the first part of the presentation that every CAN message is sent by an ECU and the identifier of the ECU uh, is called the message ID. And um, the lower it is, the higher the priority is. Here you, are the mo you, are, you have the most uh, prior, uh, you have the message with the, the biggest priority and here with the lowest priority. And you see here the, the content of the messages. Um, the thing is, if you look at the list of the message IDs here, and the list of the, at the, of the message IDs here, you can see it's the same list. Basically, it means that no other ECU uh, was talking on the bus uh, when we plugged the, OBD, uh, the Nitro OBD2 dongle. So it means that the dongle basically doesn't speak at all on the CAN bus, and that's too bad because we say, how, how is it possible that it works if it's not talking on the CAN bus? Okay. Uh, is it over? Is it just not working? Uh, well, not really. Um, the dongle is advertised as uh, working after 120 kilometers. It will just listen silently to the way you are driving, then reprogram your engine after this uh, sm small amount of, of kilometers. Um, so it was still possible that the dongle uh, was not sending anything during the first kilometers, and, but we couldn't 
just monitor uh, the CAN bus during such a, a big period of time. And uh, so we needed another approach, uh, and we chose to uh, reverse the PCB. Um, if, you, if you take the dongle apart, you can see two PCBs. Uh, the first one here is just connected on the OBD2 uh, port, and the other one seems to contain, well, something. Um, okay, so th th this is a picture of the first one. As you can see, there is no components on it at all. It's just routing uh, the, CAN, uh, the CAN wires from there to the second board. So, okay, let's go on. Um, the second one is more interesting. Um, on the front side, you can see, well, a few components, but there are not so many. You have a voltage regulator here, uh, 7805. You have a push button. This uh, diode is, is part of the voltage regulation, and that's pretty much all, all you have here. Uh, and three LEDs. You have three LEDs. Okay. <laughs> On the back side, you can see uh, here there is the, the footprints of a very small microcontroller, and uh, here is a picture with a, uh, before uh, desoldering it. And the interesting thing is that there is absolutely no reference on this device, uh, as if the manufacturer uh, took a special care to hide what was inside. Uh, and this is not so common, because usually you can find a reference on a chip. So, um, ah, yeah, also, <laughs> there is no CAN transceiver on this device. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's strange. Um, what is a CAN transceiver? A CAN transceiver is a, is a piece of hardware to translate uh, the signals from the CPU, which are basically a UART, uh, into CAN signals, uh, which are CAN high and CAN low. This is a differential pair. And uh, that's also, um, it's, but this device is not just about adapting the signals and electric conversion. It's also about real-time uh, monitoring and checking. Uh, Stan explained before that in each frame, you got a CRC and uh, an error bit. And if there is a transmission uh, error uh, on, a, on a frame, the, uh, any CAN transceiver has the duty to asserts the fault in real time. So it just, have, just has a few microseconds to, to compute the CRC in real time and say, OK, no, you just have to discard this frame. So uh, basically, two tasks for this one, electrical signal conversion and checking in real time. Uh, OK, so you have no, co no can communication. No can transfer. Okay, it smells weird. Uh, a few guys told us, yeah, but maybe it's possible to do that in software because you see those are just signals, and maybe with an IDC and so on, you can do that in software. I put a link uh, if you are interested here for a Stack Overflow discussion, which is very interesting. And a few guys say, okay, yes, it's possible to do that in full software. So you basically don't need a can transfer. Um, the thing is. As the CAN transceiver has to react in real time, you have to have a very fast CPU to do that in real time. And the guys on Stack Overflow say, OK, it's possible, but uh, at a very low speed, like 10 kilobits per second or something like this. But on a real CAN bus, on a real car, you, uh, the speed is more like 500,000 bits per second. So it's not the same uh, order of magnitude. So. Um, OK, and then some of, the, some of the guys said, OK, maybe there is some uh, can transceiver inside the ship. And they say, OK, guys, it's just a small SOP8 chip. There is nothing there, just a small microcontroller. But just to be sure, and because we like to decap chips, <laughs> I asked my intern to do that because, you know, <laughs> there are toxic fumes and things like that. So uh, here is Stan. <laughs> <laughs> in my garden. And, uh, well, it was pretty, uh, it was the first time I did that, and with Stan also. And uh, the, the thing is, it's pretty easy to do that, but uh, if you want to do it, just be careful, because it's very dangerous stuff. Uh, you can buy it on the, on the internet. It's very uh, cheap. Uh, and uh, what do you need? You need a cooking plate here to produce some heat. Uh, creme brulee, uh, or <laughs> just the ceramic plate. You pour the sulfuric acid in it, you wait for it to be hot enough, and that's all, basically, you just throw your chip in it and you're done. 
uh, just wait uh, 10 minutes and that's all. Um, so again, if you want to do it, just do it because it's fun, but uh, use protections because it's very dangerous. Okay, well, here is the result. Um, I put a, can, a real can transceiver here, and this is the, the chip you have in the Nitro OBD2 dongle. Uh, some of you, you will recognize the basic structure of a microcontroller, of a small microcontroller. Here you have the, the CPU logic, here you have the memory banks, and uh, some glue logic there, and that's pretty much all, all you have there. Uh, the interesting thing is that this does not fit into this. <laughs> so definitely there is no can transceiver into the Nitro OBD2 dongle. Um, the, imp the, 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 the other thing I would like to show is, um, I if you look at this, um, we, we said before that the, the, the Nitro OBD2 had to contain a database for all authentication algorithms, all the way to reprogram any car on the market and so on. And this is all the flash you have inside. I was expecting uh, at least a big chip of flash, but there is nothing here. Um, so basically it just uh, looks like a tiny microcontroller, like, controller, like an Arduino or something like this. And, uh, but I really wanted to know what chip it was. So uh, we have a game at the office, it, it, it's just looking for Waldo. And because the, the chip manufacturer like to uh, write uh, a chip reference inside that chip. And if, well, there is something here. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the chip, the big magnification power, you will see this, and this is the chip reference. Unfortunately, I could not uh, find any reference on the internet about the chip, this chip. I asked a few friends on Twitter and so on, but nobody could, could find it, which means, well, I don't know, this is not a big chip very well known. Uh, <laughs> if you know what it is, just tell me, send a mail or whatever, and Twitter. And, uh, and, uh, take the microphone during the question and answer session. It will be nice. So, just to sum up this part, um, this dongle is very nice, but uh, <laughs> there is no CAN communication, it does not contain any CAN transceiver, um, it has not enough power, uh, CPU power to emulate a, a CAN transceiver in full software, and uh, the most important thing is that he, it has no flash in it uh, to contain the database, you know, to reprogram any uh, engine and so on but the links are blinking uh, very well, so... <laughs> yeah, if you really want to reprogram your car, use something else. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, all of you, if you are interested in car hacking, to, to try and put some uh, OBD cable into your car because it's very easy. You just have to pull a panel to get access to your OBD port. Uh, you will just need a Raspberry Pi, uh, can shield, and a cable, and that's pretty much all you need. Um, just a few words. Uh, so you don't need to take anything apart, so it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, you can do many interesting things uh, just by using the OBD2 port of your car, uh, like fuzzing and so on. But uh, please be careful, you can hurt uh, yourself or break your engine if it's running. So if you do some fuzzing, please stop the engine before. Um, yeah, b because uh, as you saw at the beginning, I was actually recording can data or querying stuff while I was driving, driving, which was the stupidest thing I did from the whole analysis. I was able to uh, disengage ABS by fuzzing too, stuff like this, because they have some uh, systems that if they receive too many invalid kind of uh, messages, they will just shut off. So I was able to disengage stuff like this. So yeah, if you are doing stuff like this, just don't drive while doing it. For example, that's the kind of stupid mistake you do when, oh, disable the airbags. <laughs> that's very important. <laughs> you never know. Well, thank you again, and yeah, if you want to, to speak with us, you're more, more than welcome. Thank you.
Thank you indeed, guys. Uh, like I'd normally skip the kayaking talks, this time it was really amusing and I'm happy that I not, uh, that I didn't do that. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions. Um, if you want to line up, uh, there's one over there or two over there, one over here and one over there. Are there questions from the audience? Signal Angel. Um, so people on the stream are wondering where, you, where they can find your software and whether you contributed any signals you found to the OpenDBC project that is collecting signals from the canvas. Um, I haven't really heard about this yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you so, have. so right now, not that much, but I will take a look. We will take a look at at this after. After this, sorry. Mike, one. I was wondering, you try to reverse engineer to get into the secure mode so that you can access all the ECUs. Uh, sorry. You wanted to uh, re uh, reverse engineer this challenge response authentication. Yes. Uh, why did you not try to reverse engineer the diagnostic software that is used by the dealers? Because uh, this, uh, in French, we call this valise uh, with luggage, and it costs. If, if I recall correctly, about 5,000 euros by car manufacturer. So we went to a garage and asked uh, the guy, can you lend us your valise? And he just laughed at us because, no, he didn't want to. But uh, yeah, um, there, there are some partnerships you can have. There's a, a group of uh, manufacturers that offer that kind of information if you pay every month a very huge sum of money. If, uh, and use it for an hour. <laughs> but I haven't heard of it. I, I just saw a big numbers and I told myself, oh, okay, I'll find another way. Okay. Mike, number three. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just wondering how much more work is needed to actually control your car with an Xbox controller? <laughs> 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 I was asked this question, this question before, not that much, if, <laughs> if you find the right guys with the right amount of knowledge. No, the idea is that um, you'll, get, you'll get, of course, uh, you, you'll have to find a way to uh, control the uh, car from the canvas, which is not something that easily done because for all I know right now, uh, the canvas I was on was only used for broadcasting information, not really using this information for real-time uh, data. We actually uh, try to find some way to uh, know how the ECUs uh, interact with each other with Guillaume's car, so the idea was that we go to a field I am on the passenger seat, and he would just tell me, OK, try to find the ABS ECU. I will uh, brake very hard, so he was driving fast, braking. I was just checking to find which ECU would actually send something different. And after, we tried to recreate some messages, but without a lot of luck. So from the canvas, I don't think that's quite possible. But they did it. Uh, Nissan did it like two months ago with the um, GTRC. They created a Nissan GTR that is actually controlled by uh, a gamepad controller. But they have a full robot in it, just controlling the steering wheel and pedal. So it's quite easy when you have money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone two in the back, please. Uh, okay. Uh, hi. Um, nice talk. Thank you. Um, first of all, don't play around with the airbags, please. I tried to reverse engineer my old Mitsubishi. I'm a passionate Mitsubishi driver. Um, please don't drive around. You get hurt really hard. Just don't do it. Okay. Um, so, uh, my real question is, did you try to reverse engineer um, cars with an older bus than OBD ever? Because mine is from the 90s. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't, because I had my hand full already with the, with the OB. Uh, to, be, to be honest, before this analysis, I hadn't touched any kind of bus or any kind of car systems ever, so I was really discovering everything from scratch. So I just focused on the uh, OBD port and the canvas and stuff like this. But I know there are a lot of different stuff, uh, Valasek and Miller, already did uh, different kind of attacks on the Jeep, for example, or the Prius with different buses. So I, 
I ought to be to be looking at them, but right now, no, I didn't do anything else from the OBD or Canvas. Uh, Is there okay. another question from the internet? Okay. Otherwise, um, yeah, I, mic one. Just yeah. Is, okay. So, sorry, just one ten sentence. Um, I guess because of the Mitsubishi stuff, you've mentioned the car of your parents or so. I guess we should talk about the Lancer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike one. Thank you. Um, there are some other buses like um, EtherCAT or FlexRay in other um, car manufacturers. Um, what about hacking them? Uh, so uh, you also said uh, you already said that uh, maybe you will, will try it in the future. Or? Well, quite the same answer. I, I, I saw. I, I read the car can book, so I just have a few, uh, a little grasp of the other kind of. Um, protocols and bus and stuff like this. Right now I didn't do anything. I am uh, planning on trying different uh, new buses, but right now just the, I haven't touched them. I, I can't really answer more on this please than this. I don't know. I'm uh, sorry. The other thing is that um, on the OBD2 port, you just have access to the CAN bus. And uh, as far as I remember, the flex bus, uh, the, the, the flex uh, bus yeah, is uh, internal and uh, dedicated to high speed uh, buses. So um, it's not as easy to, to plug yourself onto this, uh, onto this bus uh, because you have to open your car and take uh, things apart and stuff like this. But it's definitely interesting to look at it also. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, another question from the three, please. No, it's uh, four. Okay, so just a little hint. Uh, OBD2 is actually just half of the fun. Uh, so you should definitely remove your car radio and check if there is a can bus behind that. I know for BMW you have it, and uh, there of course it's much easier to control of, uh, all of the fancy buttons that you have in your car, like uh, window uh, and wipers and all that stuff, because uh, that's completely unencrypted and so you can simply listen on this and also send your own commands. Okay, so check the other can burst in the car, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's mainly uh, the car radio because you don't have to cut anything. Just re uh, plug it off, uh, okay. take an adapter and uh, put your own wires on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another talk. <laughs> I heard we have one question from the internet now and then the one. Um, so there's a person from the Darknet who would like to leak you original diagnostic software for that kind of hardware and... Uh, the person wants to know whether you would be interested in that. Uh, I haven't heard the end of the sentence, but the beginning. Would you be interested in a software leak of original diagnostic software? <laughs> Actually, you don't have to answer that because the person is outside, but if you okay. want to say something, you can. <laughs> you have my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, your question, please. Okay, um, well, first, thank you for your very inspiring speech. Uh, luckily, or unfortunately, I don't own a car myself, otherwise. Well, what I wanted to say was, um, you now had your hands on a few Volkswagens. Uh, yeah. If you could choose a car yourself, uh, what brand would you like to um, monitor? Ah, to monitor. Uh, Actually, what I wanted, but I haven't taken the time right now, was to play with the Lancia, the big monospath, because it has Uconnect. And as far as I remember, it was one of the uh, attack vectors um, uh, Milan Valasek used uh, in the past. So I think I would go with the one with full features everywhere and remove parts to be able to get to the fun stuff. So I would take one with a lot of electronics, not too much because it's expensive, but at least a bit of electronics so that I could remove player stuff and do interesting uh, and nice stuff. Thank you. Okay, and another one over there. Hi, thank you, and I uh, enjoyed your talk. Um, I think I read you already online, uh, or I read something about doing that, what you've done. Um, it's really fun. Uh, just a few corrections to the last part. The transceiver does not do any error correction. It's just a transceiver. And uh, there is, are chips actually available which have a Cortex-M0 and the transceiver on chip uh, for a few bucks. 
Okay. Uh, so those chips exist and are used in automotive. Okay. And just for your fun for the next year, uh, choose the right car. Just appending that question from that girl. Um, there are car manufacturers who can do networking and who can't do. And you're, let's say you're currently with the right brands. Like the Italian. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have way more information than when I started this talk, which is not what I expected at first. <laughs> um, I would say final question, Mike One. Very small question, but did you consider lifting the front wheels instead of starting the engine to make it steer easy? Yes, uh, I put it on, how do you, par pain, uh, the block of cement you find in the, but it's, not, not the easiest part. Uh, what would be uh, easier, what was done, was to put cardboard uh, un, uh, under the wheels to make it easier with a little bit of oil to turn. But yeah, to be able to play without the engine turned on and with the uh, assisted direction kind of like, uh, putting the car on a car lift would be uh, the safest way. Because just uh, putting the front wheels, uh, I wouldn't see anything from the windscreen, which would be a bit disappointing. And <laughs> But yes, uh, indeed, uh, I plan to put it on the car lift soon. Sorry, Mom. Anyone who didn't get the chance to post a question on stage, I'm sure that the speakers can be approached next to it. Uh, thank you again for being here and drift on. Thank you very much. Thank you.